Hey everybody, welcome to Pathfinder. This is a series of YouTube videos that we are putting together in order to help you explore some of the big questions, uh, the questions of meaning, questions of theology, uh, just things that perhaps at North Point we don't have time to tackle on a Sunday morning. Uh, we'd like to offer this opportunity for you to maybe explore these things um, just a little deeper. And uh, I'm excited today because we have a very special guest with us, Steve Gregg. And uh, Steve, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, Steve is an author and um, uh, particularly an expert at the topic of eschatology, or uh, that's a fancy word for final things or last days or everything that has to do with when Jesus comes back. And of course, this is a hot topic these days. Um, and uh, lots of people in our church have been interested in it. I invited Steve because his book has been especially meaningful to me. Uh, he wrote a book called Revelation, The Four Views, and uh, it's a book that goes through the book of Revelation uh, chapter by chapter and helps you to understand uh, four different ways throughout the centuries, over the last 2,000 years, that mm -hmm. scholars, theologians, have looked at this apocalyptic literature, this book, and how it's been interpreted widely within the church. And it may surprise you that we've not always thought about the book of Revelation like many do today, and there have been different ways of looking at this. And so he really is an expert on how the different ways of looking at it. And so we thought, let's invite Steve to come. And uh, so we're excited to have you here and uh, just wanted to explore a few questions. Um, that's, that's fine with me. I appreciate you having me. Well, we're excited. Um, all, the, you, you may not know, as I just ask you to search for this, we also have a seminar that is on our Pathfinder series where Steve has given a lecture. It's about a three hour seminar and, and Q and A in which he's gone into great detail as to the history of the four views. And so I encourage you to look at that also. Uh, but we wanted to add these questions as a way of just, uh, adding to the value of that particular seminar, uh, that you'll find offered there. So let's just jump right in, if that's okay. All right. When it comes to final things or last days, one of the questions that's been on my heart, Steve, is uh, what are some of the things that the church in America gets right or wrong in our view of God's ultimate plan for the world? Well, I think that what modern evangelicalism often misses is that God has a plan for the world. I mean, when we think about eschatology, when people are talking about the end uh, times— they're often, the average person often is conceptualizing it as it's the end of the world and, uh, you know, we're going to go to heaven or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Bible does say that God has a plan for the world. And uh, depending on which view of eschatology you take, some believe that that plan will really never uh, be very good until Jesus comes back and then you'll have a, a millennial reign of Christ where it's all good. Uh, other views have held that God has a, that he's working a plan of extending his kingdom throughout the world, throughout this whole age. And uh, of course, it has its uh, ups and downs. You know, I mean, people say, well, it, it seems like we're in the worst times ever. Well, we're not in the worst times ever. We are perhaps in the worst times that we've lived through before in many, by many m metrics. But uh, if you go through, look at history, the past 2,000 years, there's some horrible times, uh, far worse than we even uh, would dream of going through. And things get better and they get worse, and they get better and they get worse, and they get better and worse. And whenever they get worse, there's this uh, sense that people have that, oh, this must now, this must be the end. This must be what Revelation's talking about. You know, it must be the tribulation coming or something like that. And, and unfortunately, when people get that mentality, they sometimes become less engaged in spreading the kingdom of God. And by spreading the kingdom of God, I don't mean just preaching the gospel, which is, of course, our primary mission, but the kingdom of God is spread by making disciples and by disciples becoming Christ-like and being engaged in society in, in a redemptive way so that, frankly, the net result is that society is, becomes more aware of God and God's ways and and, and things often, you know, do get better. And people don't just get saved to go away to heaven when they die. They get saved to be useful in the world. But, uh, and this can even involve political involvement. I'm not, I'm not into political activism of any kind, but uh, some Christians say, well, we shouldn't even bother with uh, politics or social change or anything like that because that's like polishing the brass on a sinking ship. You know, you don't mm -hmm. waste your time doing mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I'm saying that 
really when you get a big picture of what the Bible teaches and, and frankly how it's been received and, and perceived throughout church history, you realize that the ship might not be sinking as quickly as some feel it is. We, you know, we are truly living in, I believe, the worst times that have ever uh, happened, uh, well, certainly in our lifetime and maybe in many generations. Although uh, we don't have a Hitler running around doing what he was doing a few a couple generations ago, there yeah. uh, every generation has its antichrist type people that uh, that Christians think it's you know this must be it. Oh, I hear and, that all the time. Yeah, and in many cases, uh, if they think Jesus is coming too quickly, they just won't engage in their responsibilities in the world, at least not long term. You know, they say, well. You know, I'm not going to buy any green bananas, you know, because that's, there's no time for them to ripen. <laughs> Jesus is coming too quickly. And I, I, back when I was first in the ministry back 50-something years ago, there was this sense that Jesus is coming right away. And some people decided they weren't going to get married, or if they got married, they weren't, weren't going to have children, or they're going to not get an education, or they're not going to do anything that involves a long-term commitment because they felt that any long-term commitments would be interrupted quickly. Uh, I myself, for example, uh, initially when I got married as a young person, I, I didn't want to have children because I thought Jesus was coming too soon. That's how our teachers were telling us. Uh, I'm glad that God overrode that, and I now have five children, and they're all grown up, and they're not even young. You know, they're, uh, they're, uh, I've got grandchildren. So, yeah. But you see, there was very much, or the, the more there's this uh, sense that we are definitely at the end of the world, and this happens from time to time, when, especially when the world gets very unusually chaotic, mm -hmm. or when something's going on in the Middle East especially. You know, the mm -hmm. Middle East is what everyone's looking at. Say, oh, this, this definitely is a sign of the times. Um, it often will get people to disengage, and when, when Christians need to be more engaged, yeah. uh, the world needs us more than ever. And, and, and of course, it, it needs us to preach the gospel to them, but we sometimes think of preaching the gospel just means we're going to give them, you know, the, the world's anyway, we better get them a ticket to heaven, you know, right. as quickly yeah. as possible. But uh, Jesus never really talked about getting a ticket to heaven. He talked about the kingdom of God and becoming a, and the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grows into a, a great plant that, uh, uh, you know, shelters helpless creatures and so forth is a, uh, in his parable. But there's, God does care about the world. He made it and he intends in some way or another to redeem it. It, it, either by the coming of Christ, which of course Jesus is going to come, and that'll redeem the whole thing. But in the meantime, before Jesus comes back, there's there's activities God has the church involved with, which if you look at the trajectory of the past 2,000 years, you'll see the earth has changed for the better, uh, by many measures. Of course, there's some things that have never changed. But, um, you know, the, the conscience of nations is much different today because of the presence of Christianity in the world than it was 2,000 years yeah, ago. Yeah, and improved. And much improved, yes. Yeah, wow. You know, um, something you just said triggered me to the, another question that was on my mind. And um, you're talking about modern events or things that happen. And I'm wondering for those listening, um, if you could give us your sense of, is it right or wrong to sort of match the Bible's prophetic and apocalyptic vision that which it sets forth, and try and match it to the current events. So, for example, what's going on with Israel right now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've heard people say that, well, Russia and China is Gog and Magog, as you see you know, right. in Ezekiel, or um, the various marks of the beast. I remember when COVID was happening all over social media. Of course, if you get the vaccine, you could be taking the mark of the beast. Right. Uh, weather events. Uh, I heard pastors teaching about, because of the... Um, because of this, before the Senate, they were te they were testifying about alien abduction. Mm -hmm. They were talking about, well, that would explain how people are going to explain away the rapture of the church. And mm -hmm. so you're looking at current events, yeah. and you're trying to look at apocalyptic literature and revelation. What, what do you think about all that? Like, well, I'm old enough now to see that in a different perspective than I did 50 years ago, because 50 years ago, exactly the same things were being done, but they were different current events than we have today. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, in studying church history, I find that it wasn't just in my, our centuries, it was in previous centuries, that the, the, there was always some Christians were able to link the crises of their times with things they believed Revelation was saying. Uh, and obviously, if they thought that meant they were living in the end of the world, they miscalculated. And, and so did we when I was younger. I mean, we're talking 54 years ago. 
Uh, many of the best-selling Christian authors about Bible prophecy were saying that Jesus has to come by 1988, and, uh, and they believe the rapture has to come sooner than that, so they said, you know, the rapture's got to come by uh, 1981. And some of the best respected Bible teachers were saying things like that. Now, that's, that's 40, 40, almost 40 years ago those, mm-hmm. those prophecies were proven to be false. So is it good to try to match things up like that? I'm not sure why it would be. I think, I think a lot of times people say, well, Jesus wants us to see the signs of the times. And I remember that. Uh, people say it a lot. They say, well, we need to know the signs of the times. I think, does he really? I mean, the term signs of the times is found only once in the Bible, and he's not talking about the end times. He's talking to the Pharisees, how they weren't recognizing the sign of their own times. He's saying, you know, you hypocrites, you can discern what the weather is like from the sky the previous day, but you can't discern the signs of the times, meaning they were living in the time when the Messianic prophecies were being fulfilled before their eyes, and they couldn't recognize it. Now, there's no corresponding statement anywhere in Scripture that says that people need to recognize the signs of the end times. And if so, it becomes a very difficult thing because there's no specific signs of the end times that are um, unmistakable. Yeah. Now, uh, because virtually everything that people say are signs of the times now, there's been something at, at least as likely to be so in previous generations. It's just something new. Like, for example, um, th- this is what I call newspaper exegesis. When, when okay. people, they're trying to re- interpret the Bible, which is the process of exegesis, and instead of using the Bible to interpret the Bible, they use the newspaper stories to do wow. it. And, uh, you know, my dad, I grew up in a Christian home where my dad had a lot of theological books, and one book he had was written bef- by uh, an author I won't mention, but he wrote between World War I and World War II. Now, today we have the United Nations, but they didn't have that before World War II. They had the League of Nations. After World War I, there was the League of Nations, which was kind of precursor of the United Nations. Mm-hmm. And, and this author was saying, well, it says in Revelation there's going to be a ten-nation confederacy in Europe, a revival of the Roman Empire. And he said, right now we see that's happening in the, in the League of Nations. Wow. It's the ten-nation confederacy. And he said, I anticipate an objection, because someone's going to say, but there's 13 nations in the League of Nations. He said, that's the diabolical thing. Satan doesn't want us to recognize it as the ten-nation conspiracy. Now, of course, it wasn't. And, and I've more recently, in the 70s, Hal Lindsey said the same thing about, uh, not, not about the United Nations, but about the European common market and European Union. And, you know, there's always something that it, in the newspapers, so we can say, oh, I can link that with this, but are we supposed to? And if we're supposed to, how are we supposed to know that this is the time that we're right and the others who had, as they thought, good enough reason to think they were in at times, they were wrong. My question, <laughs> excuse me, when I heard a preacher once, not too many years ago, say, Jesus tells us to, to look for the signs of the times, first thing I thought was, no, he doesn't. And secondly, why would he? Uh, what is the benefit of looking for the signs of the times? Well, then we'll know that Jesus is coming is near. And what are we supposed to do differently then if we know that? What am I supposed to, if, if some, I have a friend locally here who actually is always trying to get me to notice the signs of the times. I say, well, I'm not seeing it that way, but if I saw it just your way, how would I live my life today differently or the next day? Hmm. Say, well, you'd be more, we'd be more enthusiastic about winning the loss. We'd see more urgency. Well, I, I have as much urgency about that knowing they're going to die someday. I, they, they could die today. I don't know if Jesus is going to come back today, but anyone I know might die today. Mm. And how is that not enough to know? I mean, and I do know. You know people sometimes say, Are, do you think we're living in the last generation? I say, oh, I'm living in my last generation, and you're living in your last generation. So <laughs> I, I don't know if this is the last generation, yeah. but we better live like we're in the last generation because it is for we us. We are on a clock. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how knowing when Jesus is going to come back, which we're not allowed to know. Jesus said it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has put in his own authority, so it's not for us even to know. I, I've always wondered why so many Christians want to spend their whole ministries focused on trying to know the thing that Jesus said it's not for you to know. Hmm. But after he said that, he said, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses and to all the world. And, and so how about if we focus on the mission that we've been given and not try to spend our time knowing too much about what Jesus said is not ours to know, hmm. and allow God to work out His plan and, and make sure that what, you know when your Master comes, He finds you so doing, as yeah, He said. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's good. I I find that 
uh, as a pastor, what I find people struggling with is the worry and the anxiety that just comes from so many uncer- uncertain things. So, for example, uh, in America, mm-hmm. well, first of all, the American church, everything is very centered around America. Yeah. And I find that interesting. But um, the culture wars that are happening at home, and to many evangelical Christians, it's like, boy, the whole world's going to hell mm-hmm. and because of uh, certain things related to morality choices and all of that, and culture changing. Uh, then they hear about wars overseas, uh, the, the the election tensions. Mm-hmm. Now we have elections that will be coming up. Um, uh, of course, I've already mentioned the pandemic, but all of these things feed this system of worry. And then when you combine that with economic crisis, and I guess the question I'd ask is, how how should we navigate when we feel we are operating in uncertain times as a Christian? How do we navigate in a way that's faithful to our Great Commission calling, but also trust the promises of God? Mm-hmm. Well, I... Uh... I personally think that we have every reason to believe we're living in uncertain times, no matter what's in the news. Because again, we're not guaranteed our next breath. Mm -hmm. We're not guaranteed uh, that disaster will not strike our families. We're not guaranteed that our nation might not be blown up and made a a crater by a a nuclear bomb from some other country. No guarantees about that. Mm -hmm. That's even if the end times are centuries in the future. So you're, even, if that, yeah. even if it were a thousand years from now, according to end times of the Bible, America could go through travesty. Exactly. And it doesn't necessarily mean one is happening. Right, know, one is affecting uh, right. I mean, the, 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 there's a very important key, and, and it's like I was saying, if I knew this was the end of the world, how would I live differently? Hmm. I don't think I'd live differently. If, if, I, if, I, if I would live differently, if I knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, then I should start doing that now. Hmm. Even if I don't believe he's necessarily coming tomorrow or even in my lifetime, I should be doing whatever I want him to find me doing. Now, one of the things Jesus said to do in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 is don't worry about tomorrow. Wow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what is coming. He says sufficient for the day is the trouble of thereof. And by that he means to, that each day has a, enough troubles of its own hmm. <clears throat> to worry about. You don't need to be borrowing anxiety about tomorrow because the Christian life is supposed to be a life of walking with Jesus, trusting Jesus, enjoying uh, the security of knowing that he's your, your God and your king, and he's, uh, and he's you know, the angel of the Lord and camps around about you and to deliver you. Uh, he will allow trials in your life, but that's, that the encouraging thing is that when they come, he has allowed them. And that's why it's encouraging. If, if, I, if something horrible happens to me, and I know that, well, God allowed this because he, he loves me, and therefore he expects something good can come from this, I still don't like the horrible thing, but at least, I mean, I might have that hor- horrible thing without that awareness. Uh, you know, I might have that horrible thing thinking, where's God now? I have no, like Job didn't know where God was. It, the, the worst part of Job's trials was not the pain of the trials, although that was su- significant, but that he wondered where God was. He thought, mm-hmm. hey, I thought God, I thought God was my friend. How come he's coming against me like this? And, but if you know God, of course you're going to have hard times and he's going to give you grace for those times. There's a promise that he'll give you grace. His grace is sufficient. Mm-hmm. Um, we are possibly facing uh, horrors in our nation that we haven't faced in our lifetime, but th- it's not as if they haven't been faced by Christians in other times in other nations, or even right now wow. as we speak. I mean, why should we Americans be so special that we're the only ones who don't uh, go to prison for our faith and be murdered? Martyred? I, right at this moment, I have a friend, a Christian friend, who is falsely accused of a crime he didn't do, he didn't plead. They gave him a plea bargain. If he said he was guilty, they're going to let him go right away. But he didn't, and they they left exculpatory evidence out of the trial, and they condemned him. They gave him 28 years. He's in San Quentin right now. They, they just they just transferred him from. He's got 28 years in prison. They just transferred him from Southern California to San Quentin, and the first day, his cellmate wanted to rape him, and because he wouldn't participate, his cellmate knifed him, and he almost died. He was in the hospital wow. just the day before yesterday. Wow. Now I, I think. This guy's in there for another 14 years or something like that, and, and with a cellmate like that, this, he's in hell. I mean, what could the Antichrist do to me <laughs> that's worse than, than what this guy's going through right now? And he's in America. He's, you know, there's been Christians throughout the world been in very similar situations as long as there's been Christians on yeah, the planet. because of their and, faith. Right. We are not exempt. This man's innocent. He didn't commit a crime, and these things are happening to him. So we have to say, well, you know, 
I can't stand the thought of having that happen to me. Well, then don't think about it, but think about God. Think about God giving you grace to make it through because everyone has trials that are challenging. And, and if you're worried, oh no, what if it's the end of the world? Well, actually a Christian shouldn't be worried about that. If, if I thought it was definitely the end of the world, that, that's exciting to me. Uh, this world has not been a friend to Christianity much of the time. And if Jesus comes back, that's fabulous. But, but even if he doesn't, uh, we have to be, we need to learn how not to worry. Yeah. Jesus said, if you worry, it won't add a cubit to your height. It won't, <laughs> you can't make one hair white or black by worrying. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, God is in control. You have a father. If you worry about things, that's what the heathen worry about. They don't have a father. You do. What's wrong with you? Wow. You know? Wow. Yeah, that, that is insightful. When, when, you're, um, when any Christian is studying apocalyptic literature, a book like Revelation, um, what are the right—because we're all going to do this, and mm-hmm. of course I appreciate you being here to answer some of these questions, and, and I'm excited about uh, the seminar that you're doing. Um, but when somebody goes to the Word of God on their own, can you give us an idea of what are the hermeneutical practices, hermeneutics being the— almost the, I want to say the science of the interpretation of Scripture. Mm-hmm. What are the right interpretive rules when approaching a book like Revelation to help guide you in forming an opinion about these things? Yeah. Can you lay that out for somebody that wants to study the Bible, but do it in a healthy way? I actually think the biggest challenge that leads people into confusion about Revelation is not following the right hermeneutic principles. Okay. And that's because... Western civilization doesn't have the same literary conventions that the ancient Middle East had, you know? Hmm. And, uh, you know, we have to remember we're re- when we read anything in the Bible, we're reading something that's at least 2,000 years old hmm. from a very different culture, written in languages that aren't spoken anymore. I mean, these are, it, it, the Bible's written in dead languages now in a country that's the Middle East. I, even when I see movies about the modern Middle East, these people are so different than us in their culture and stuff. Mm-hmm. But 2,000 years ago, you know, you need to know you're approaching a book that's very, for, written by people with different assumptions. And one of the things they assume differently in many cases was that literature had to be written in a literal way. Mm-hmm. Uh, we assume that because our literature is. Now, most of the Bible is written in a literal way because most of the Bible is historical narrative. And there's no reason to doubt that the historical narrative is as literal in the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament narrative, as, as it would be if it was written today, because they, they were as interested in literal history then as they are now. But they had a special class of books that were more impressionistic, uh, the apocalyptic books. Mm-hmm. And all, all Bible scholars agree Revelation would be one of those written in the apocalyptic style. There's some like Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah in the Old Testament that also featured this style. Mm -hmm. And the Jews had many other books that did. But uh, when the Jews wrote books in that style, they in no way expected it to be taken literally. Mm -hmm. They they had symbolic visions. Daniel sees seven uh, or or four beasts coming out of the sea. One's a lion, one's a bear, one's a leopard, one's a fierce beast that has iron teeth and, uh, you know, uh, ten horns. And... uh, and it turns out they're not beasts at all. You know, the first one is the Babylonian Empire, the second one's the Media Persian Empire, then the Grecian Empire, then the Roman Empire. It's not really animals at all he's talking about, but he sees animals. Mm. But they're symbols of empires. Mm. Revelation, of course, does the same thing. And it's the same style of literature. Apocalyptic literature is not intended to be taken literally. The reader's supposed to be smart enough to recognize this is a symbolic vision about something that really is real in the literal world. Mm. but it's not being described in literal terms. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest problem people have had, especially reading Revelation, is coming to it without the awareness that this is a different kind of book than any of the other books you've read in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It's the only apocalyptic book in the New Testament. There's some in the Old. But, you know, if you read the Gospels and Acts, you take those literally. You read the Epistles, and it's fairly literal, and it should be taken that way. But when you get to Revelation, you're walking into another world, as it were, at least another literary world. Hmm. And it's talking about things that could be as familiar in real life as those described in the other books about, but now it's being described in non-literal terms. Mm -hmm. And um, yet many teachers, they say, if they don't take it literally, you're not being just, you know, you're not following the Bible faithfully, you know, if you don't take it literally. Well, take literally the things that are supposed to be taken literally, that's good hermeneutics, and take non-literally the things that are clearly not supposed to be taken literally. And you say, well, how do I know if Revelation is supposed to be taken literally? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I, I'll ask you, does anyone on the planet, does any Christian believe the world will be reigned over by an animal with seven heads and ten horns? The Bible describes it that way, but it's not an animal that it's describing. That's a symbol for it. Does anyone believe that Jesus is an actual lamb with seven eyes and seven horns? That's how he's described in Revelation 5, 6, and 27 other times throughout the book of Revelation, the lamb. Is he literally a lamb? No, he's not. That's a symbol of Jesus. I mean, we, we, we are so accustomed to thinking, oh, Jesus is the lamb of God, we forget that's not literal. He's not, he doesn't have wool, you know, he's right. not a four-footed beast, right. uh, with, and he doesn't have seven eyes and seven horns. That's, it's like we're so ac accustomed to the imagery that we forget that it's symbolic imagery, you yeah. know? But oh, you only have to think for a moment and realize, well, wait a minute, no, nobody, no, no one thinks there's going to be an animal ruling the world with seven heads and ten, ten horns, and especially since the book of Revelation tells us the seven heads are, are seven hills and the ten horns are ten kings, hmm. you know, it actually tells us it's not literally. Yeah. Uh, and this is the way, essentially, the whole book is written. Now, a lot of people will say, well, we take the whole book of Revelation literally except the parts that are obviously non-literal. Right. Well, the more you think about it, most of the book is obviously non-literal. I mean, there are some descriptions that you could possibly take literally, but why would you take them literally when the mass of it is symbolic? Mm. I mean, for example, the two witnesses. Everyone wants to know, who do you think the two witnesses are going to be? And they're assuming the two witnesses are two literal men. Right. And, uh, you know, is it Moses and Elijah? Is it Moses and Enoch? Is it someone else? Uh, I'm always asked, who are the two witnesses? And in my opinion, the two witnesses are symbolic, not of two actual men, but of something else. Mm -hmm. And, and someone say, but you could take it literally. Uh, you can picture two actual guys doing those things. You could. I mean, that's, that is at least one vision that's not so fabulous that you couldn't take it literally. Mm -hmm. But why impose a literal hermeneutic just there? when the chapters before and after have been seamlessly symbolic. I mean, the, the thing is, to have the, to have the hermeneutic, that is, I'll take it literally except the places where, you, where it's obviously symbolic. Well, to, to some scholars who know apocaly apocaly apocalyptic literature, all of it is obviously symbolic. Right. And, um, and of course, then if you have to decide, is that what apocalyptic literature wants you to do, is take it literally except where you can't? Yeah. Or does apocalyptic literature, is it characterized by symbolism all the way down, you yeah. know? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. So that's the hermeneutic problem I think people have, is they don't, they're not familiar with the fact that something can be true mm -hmm. and describing realities that are literal realities, but it's not describing them in terms that are literal correspondence, that yeah. they're symbolic terms. Sure. So if somebody were to ask you, okay, then, it's apocalyptic literature, it's not to be taken literally... What would you say, what are the benefits then of going to Revelation? What is the value of reading Revelation as a book? Well, it promises a blessing to those who read it and keep its words, so I guess I'm going to okay. go with that. Yeah. But as far as the specific value, I think that um, it really depends on which interpretation of Revelation one assumes. Mm -hmm. uh, in, there are some who believe that Revelation is really telling about things that were future in John's day, but which have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But they're described symbolically, but they've been fulfilled in, no, in uh, identifiable historical events. In which case, you read Revelation the same as you'd read, uh, you know, Daniel or Isaiah, and you see it. Oh, here's fulfilled prophecy. You know, mm -hmm. God said it was going to happen. It happened. Just you know, it, it did happen. So mm -hmm. God is faithful. Mm -hmm. You know, it would serve the same purpose that fulfilled prophecy in general would. But in so far as there may be something uh, in it that's still to be future. Um, we have to hold with a light hand any convictions we have as to what it, it's going to look like. Mm. I was talking in the green room today with somebody uh, about the, uh, the mark of the beast mm. because it says that if you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. Now, popular teachers almost always say, well, the reason you won't be able to buy or sell without the mark is because it, it, it is a replacement for cash. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a credit number that you have to have in a chip or in, in the old days before the chips were around, a, a laser tattoo on your hand, you know, yeah. whatever the technology is of the time they, they use it. But the idea is that you're going to have to have this on your hand and at the point of purchase you have to be scanned to pay and you can't use money and if you don't have this, the mark you can't buy stuff. Yeah. And so the, the, the teaching that everyone hears is there's going to be a cashless society. Mm -hmm. 
Now, in my opinion, that's more newspaper exegesis because probably we are moving toward a cashless society, but is that what revelation means? Uh, before there was the technology to talk about credit numbers on your hand and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, scholars typically thought that the reason you can't buy or sell without the beast, the mark of the beast, is because you'll simply be ostracized and people won't do business with you. You'll be ostracized from the commercial community, like, like Jews were in Nazi Germany. Hmm. You know, It's not that there wasn't money, it's that there weren't people who were willing to associate Exchange with you. Exchange money with you. Exactly. Right. They, yeah. they, it was because you were not conforming or you were persona non grata, and therefore people went to someone else to buy their stuff instead of you. And, hmm. and uh, So in other words, it's more like an economic boycott that's being described here. If you're not conforming with the beast system, hmm people will just not deal with you, not, mm -hmm. not that there's no cash. Yeah. Now, of course, if there is no cash, well, then that, that would be an explanation of that. But Christians have had explanations of that before cashless societies were ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we sometimes read into it, mm -hmm. you know, what is in our times, when we don't realize that if we didn't have that current event to read into it, there's other ways to make sense of it, and it doesn't... It never actually, there's no actual prediction of a cashless society there, you know? Right, right. It's an inference from, from current events. So this is what people are tempted to do. Hmm. Uh, and I think the biggest thing, I don't want to go on too long about this, I can go forever, but the biggest thing that I would advise people when they're reading Revelation is do not assume that the teachers they're listening to have the only explanation. Wow. Because uh, my, my book, Revelation for Views, shows that there are four entirely different ways of looking at Revelation, which teachers of the same stature and the same scholarship and the same devotion to Christ uh, have, have taught, and that almost every part of Revelation that the popular teachers tell you what it means, there's at least three other views that, right. that people equal to them in knowledge and possibly greater than them in knowledge, because yeah. most of these teachers don't know there's other views. Yeah. They've only yeah. been taught one thing, so they repeat it, you know? But, I mean, when you study out uh, historically, all the ways that uh, the Christian church has understood Revelation, mm -hmm. you realize that all, virtually every passage that our teachers, oh, it's clearly talking about this, and yeah, there's at least three other possibilities. Well, and this is why I have appreciated this book so much. Again, I can't encourage everybody enough to pick this up, Revelation, The Four Views, because it was the first book I had read that I felt as though I don't see an agenda here other than to explain to me historically what theologians throughout the ages, the last 2,000 mm -hmm. years, have thought about these passages so that I can weigh the evidence mm -hmm. and come to some sort of conclusion after then weighing the evidence and looking at the history of it uh, and the theology. And I didn't even know where you stood mm -hmm. as the author. Yeah, I don't advocate any of you in the, in the book, yeah. It, which which I, I applaud. Mm. I thank you for allowing mm -hmm. me to make up my mind without feeling yeah. coerced or manipulated. Now, um, so I just encourage everybody to get this and to, of course, watch the seminar. Um, before we're done, um, I, I would like to give you the opportunity because we were at dinner uh, last night and you mentioned to me a book that you feel is more important than this book. And I don't have a copy in front of me, right. but I want to provide the opportunity for people to get it because I've not read mm -hmm. it yet. Yes. But just share with me what you were yeah. sharing. It's not a book that I recommend instead of this book. It's not another subject, uh, but it's the same size. I wrote it a couple of years ago. It's an exposition on the kingdom of God. Mm. What, what it is, Jesus talked about nothing except the kingdom of God. His parables were all, the kingdom of God is like this, to what should we like in the kingdom of God? It's like this. Uh, Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Mm. Uh, from the beginning to the end of the New Testament, the kingdom of God is, is front and center. And every Christian has heard that expression, kingdom of God. Mm. But if you ask 10 Christians... Can you tell me what the kingdom of God actually is? You're not going to get a, a very good answer from probably nine of them. Hmm. You know, hmm. it's very rare that Christians who who even use the term in their in their loose speech about you know oh, I'm doing kingdom work you know kind of stuff. Uh, we're just you know we just want to promote the kingdom. Well, what do you mean by the kingdom? What does it mean? And and so this book is actually called Empire of the Risen Sun S O N, hmm. uh, and it's basically the kingdom of God is that, uh, that society that is reigned over by Christ as king. Hmm. Uh, and and the, the book expounds on it. Uh, actually, there's two books, book one and book two. Uh, Empire of the Risen Sun, book one, is subtitled There is Another King. Hmm. And Empire of the Risen Sun, book two, is subtitled All the King's Men. Hmm. The second book is practical. 
The first is exposition. So I expound on the scriptures about what the kingdom is, what the, what Jesus said, what what uh, the apostle said. Uh, so it's more it's more like when Paul writes Ephesians and has three chapters of theology and then three chapters of practical. Yeah. So that's how the two books are. One's uh, the second one's practical application, more of like a discipleship wow. A teaching. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I'm so excited to read it. I also, again, just because we're talking about your books, have to say that y a number of years ago, uh, there was a book that was written. Uh, I want to say, I, I remember the title was Love, Love Wins. Wins. Yeah, from yeah, Rob Bell. Rob Bell. Mm -hmm. It was written. Yeah. And I remember because of Rob Bell's personality and his uh, mm -hmm. celebrity mm -hmm. in the evangelical world, it was very popular, but the book was disturbing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to be bold enough to say here was bad theology. Right. And I, I didn't like it. I wouldn't even recommend it. Mm -hmm. But I remember then saying, okay, I want to read something healthy on the topic of hell because it was a theology of hell. Yeah. Um, and uh, so could you just share that book too while we're at it? Because you did write a book yeah. on hell. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Nelson Publishers uh, published the Revelation book and they later also published another book I wrote on the three views of hell. Yeah. Uh, they gave it the title... All You Want to Know About Hell, which I hated the title. It sounded like, you know, hell for dummies kind of thing. All You Want to Know About Hell. Yeah. I, I said, this is not a book about all you want to know about hell. This is talking, this looking at the three views of hell yeah. and, uh, and, and seeing how they jibe with the character of God and the purposes of God. And um, anyway, it's, to my mind, it's the most balanced book comparing three views of hell that are written by a single author. There's, mm -hmm. There are books like three or four views of hell that are written by yeah. that many authors. Zondervan has put out some of them. Right. In fact, Zondervan's putting out the hell book. The hell book is now being put out right now, this year. Again, a revision of it, not very different, but Zondervan's putting it out. Ah. And, uh, and it's going to be called Why Hell? Three, uh, a critical look at three Christian views. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I, honestly, all of your writing, what I've enjoyed, yeah, I just say, because you won't say it, is just thoughtful. And I think that you do a great job at just trying to lay out the information so that people can can do a thoughtful Bible study mm -hmm. that's meaningful. Yeah. And so I want to thank you for that. And thank I want to you. thank you for taking the time to be here on Pathfinder. 90 seconds left here. If you could just give me a nutshell version, version, what is the message of Revelation uh, in a nutshell? Uh, it's, it's not a simple line, but I would say if we reduced it to its most simple core, the message of Revelation is that God wins. Hmm. That Jesus is sovereign. Uh, r nations rise and fall, but they are under his control. He raises up kings and brings down kings, and ultimately his people are vindicated and prevail with him. Wow. That's mm -hmm. beautiful mm -hmm. and, and encouraging. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks for being a part of Pathfinder. Love you guys.